Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today we are going to be studying, actually it's going to be a little mini-series here, hopefully. I mean, <laughs> it should be. Uh, you know how that goes, but uh, it, it should be short. It should be short. It's going to be on the history of the Holy Spirit in Adventism. And this one's called Part One, Darkness to Light. And it's going to show how over time the understanding of the Holy Spirit actually, uh, the understanding grew more and more amongst the what was the Millerite movement to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And as a, a young child, right, that grows up, that doesn't fully comprehend everything, as they become an adolescent and then later on a young adult and then, then they grow to full maturity, they begin to understand these things more and more. Obviously, a, a child's knowledge and the wisdom and experience and knowledge of an adult really can't be compared. And so it's the same thing with God's fledgling church. The knowledge and understanding of the Holy Spirit grew and progressed over time. And so this sermon, I was talking with, uh, with Paul in the back. You know, things have escalated in these last days. Um, we love God. We love His message but we're not here to be your friends. We're here to get the truth out to the world. We love the truth. And today, we're going to be, uh, we're gonna be as, this, as the saying goes, we're going to unload both barrels because we are standing on the brink of the promised land and we are having relationships with the Moabite women. That's what we're doing. And Paul said it, he said it this morning, perfect, really resonated with me. Actually, you know, you need to go, you need to check out that sermon. You need to listen to the sermon from this morning. Um, if not before this, after it. He talked about being a soldier, and we are called to be soldiers. You know, even in Pilgrim's Progress, that parable illustration, there, at a certain point, they put the armor on Christian. And they force him to fight with the devil himself in the form of Apollyon. There's war. We're at war. And that, in, that involves naming names. You know, if you're a platoon and you have somebody who's not doing their job right or doing something that's going to hurt the unit, you call it out. You know, the more you think and the more you, you meditate upon these, these different concepts that people are, are thinking are slam dunks and trump cards on you about, for instance, naming names, the Holy Spirit's another issue which we're going to talk about today. And the more ridiculous it sounds, the more you think about it. I mean, if we're supposed to be a watchman on the walls of Zion, right, and we're supposed to be watching for any danger, whether it's inside the camp or outside the camp, and one of the congregants just lights a fire right there, doesn't matter whether they intended to light the fire or not. It doesn't matter if they have nefarious reasons for it or not. That doesn't really matter. That matters with God. It doesn't matter with the watchman. Does the watchman stand up there and say, let's say the guy's name is John who did it down. He, caught, he started a fire down, down in, inside the camp somewhere, and it's a danger to people. Is the watchman on the wall supposed to say, hey, guys, hey, I just want to let you know. Fires are bad, and you should stay away from them. They can be pretty dangerous, you know. Wink, wink, fires are bad. And hoping that they start looking at the person with... No, you say, John started a fire over here. Stay away from it. That's what you do. So this whole thing about naming names and, and not saying that not naming names, go look at the pressing issues on naming names. It's very clear that we are to do exactly that. And as Paul stated, any time in the Bible where you have an interaction between two people, it's the same thing as naming the name. You're saying it right to their face. Everybody sees it. People are going to take that. They're going to tell the people who weren't there exactly what happened. But this is another side issue that people are, are focused on. And I want to give, uh, before we have prayer, and then we'll let Paul say something first, but... Um, 
a lot of this research came from Chris Chung, and I really, really appreciate it. He sent it over to me. He said, please do something about this. Solidify the people is what he said. That was his words. And I said, you know, I'm doing a sermon series right now. I hope I can, I'm, I'm going to get to it at some point. And about a year later, I'm getting to it now. But I thank you, Chris Chung, for the framework. I've added some of my own stuff as well. But we're going to be talking about this. This is another side issue that Adventists are, are, are so focused on. And like I said, things have escalated. If you are not giving the third angel's message, it's salvational. That's it. You're lost. Paul? And I want to make another comment about the military issue. The reason this country is here is because the American military was so different than the European militaries yeah. because the simple fact that if you, and, and it's an amazing history to study some of the individuals, they weren't even soldiers. The American military is trained down to the individual, right. regardless of rank or whatever, can take over a situation, make decisions, and get a result. Absolutely. The only military in the world where a private, the lowliest private in a company, whether it's on a ship, whatever, is capable of being able, if everybody else is not available, to take command and get a result. That's Christ's soldiers. Amen. We, because we have the training through the Holy Spirit, they want to deny that. Amen. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. That's what we're called to be. Now, as we get into this Holy Spirit issue and the history, this, this, is, this is going to be something I'm telling you right now. There's going to be people that love this sermon, and there's going to be people that hate this sermon. And there's not really going to be that many people in between. Um, so before, without further ado, let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, we ask for the eye salve this morning. We ask that we would not focus on the things that you would not have us focus on. But we would focus on the things that matter most. That's the reason for this sermon today, Lord. We ask that you would open our eyes, help us to see as we look through the history of the Holy Spirit issue. And in the words of my, my brother in Christ, Chris Chung, may this message solidify the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> go ahead. And I will leave you alone. The reason I made that statement, I know you wanted to pray, was this. Tyndale said that before he was done, and he said this to a bishop and a nobleman at their table, when he translated the Bible, he wanted the most simple plowman working yeah. in the, the plow field boy, yeah. to be able to debate the scriptures with the highest of the clergy. In other words, in God's army, the lowest of the low will be the mightiest of the mighty when armed with the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, and that's why God will win. Has won. Amen. And that's through their own diligent study. That's what he wanted. I will cause the plowboy to know more about the scripture than you or the pope. Wow, praise the Lord. So these are my words here. The Millerites were a mixed bag of individuals ranging from many varied backgrounds. The people who made up the Millerites hailed from many different persuasions. Some were Baptists, Methodists, Seventh-day Baptists even, Presbyterians, Campbellites, Anglicans, Congregationalists, many, Episcopalians, some Catholics even. There was conservative and liberal worldviews in the movement. Every manner of theological view blew from within the hearts of what would become Seventh-day Adventism. Quote, the pioneers studied out their views over years, even decades, which brought out more and more light, such as the sanctuary, the investigative judgment, the correct understanding of Daniel and Revelation, even more so than what they understood in 1844 grew it grew exponentially their understanding of what Daniel and Revelation actually meant. 
the Sabbath issue, the state of the dead, righteousness by faith, clean and unclean foods and other health reforms. These are all things that they, they didn't have in 1844 that they, they grew, as they studied, they learned, and they progressed towards closer and closer towards God and closer and closer towards the light of the truth. Other issues had to be dealt with over time and corrected, right? There was, there was misunderstandings, like the 2520, like Jesus being a created being, and the Godhead Trinity doctrine. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So they came from darkness to light, folks. And we're heading back, as we see at apostate Protestantism today, we are willfully heading back into darkness. So it works the other way as well. But as they were studying, they learned, especially in the days when Mrs. White was still alive. Here's a warning from Ellen White from Manuscript Release, uh, Volume 14, page 179. She says, It is not essential for you to know and be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, which the Father shall send in my name. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. This refers to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ, called the Comforter. Again, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. There are many mysteries which I do not seek to understand or to explain. They are too high for me and too high for you. On some of these points, silence is golden. Piety, devotion, sanctification of soul, body, and spirit. This is essential for us all. And folks, she made that statement. And as she made that statement, this issue continued to be a, an issue within the church where people were button heads over it. And so she actually made even more plainer statements later on. It's understandable that the Holy Spirit would be the representative of Jesus Christ, as we just saw, that when, when Mrs. White says here the reason that the Holy Spirit needed to be sent was that she says, her words, verbatim, this refers to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ called the Comforter. Now, when we look in Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, page 93, just a few uh, maybe 20 or so pages before that, we see some information that she gives us about Jesus Christ. Listen. She says, cumbered with humanity. What does that mean, cumbered? It means held down in some way. So Jesus is cumbered with humanity. Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them go to his Father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. So what does that mean? That means very clearly here, Jesus, when he became a man, he became a man. He lost the ability of omnipresence. He can now, and for all of eternity, he could only be in one place at one time. So he would send his representative to represent him. The Holy Spirit, it says, was divested of the personality of humanity, meaning he did not, the Holy Spirit was not a man. He was not cumbered with humanity like Jesus was, Jesus who became a man. When the Bible says that the Father gave His only begotten Son, that's what it means. He gave us. Jesus went from being 
you know, fully 100% God in every way to being fully 100% God in every way except for his physical body, which is human. And he will always be a man throughout all of eternity. Still God, still all-knowing. When you open your mouth to pray, he hears your prayers. He knows. So he's present in that sense. But could he be in multiple places at once? No. The Holy Spirit was divested of that. He didn't have that problem, just like the Father doesn't. So the Holy Spirit could be in every place at one time. You see, when God said that he was giving us his son, he wasn't, it wasn't a game of semantics. It wasn't a, a false promise. He really meant that. He gave his son to humanity. And for better or worse, with all the pros and all the cons that go with being a human being, that's what Jesus is now up to and including the scars that he will keep on his body, on his forehead, in his side, on his hands, and on his feet for all of eternity. Paul? And after you said all that, I understand this much of what you said. Zero. True. Other than one thing, God became man. That's right. I don't know what the rest of it means. We know clearly from the Spirit of Prophecy, God has a body. So Absolutely. I don't know what you just said, other than deity became physically a mm -hmm. man, right. and portion of deity gave up omnipresence yes. for the privilege of doing that. And I'm right. saying that sarcastically. Well, it was a privilege to them, actually, because they wanted to save us. Amen. Amen. Rita? Mrs. White said that Jesus, by painful experience, yes. became a man. So the incarnation was a painful experience for him. Wow. Yes. And the blending of the two, Mrs. White says, we don't know where one ends and one begins. We just know that they were perfectly blended in, in the man Christ Jesus. So we don't really understand, right? But we do know we, what we can work with is how God has revealed himself to us and we're not going to stretch and go further than that and we're not going to undercut that and say that it doesn't mean what it clearly says right well we shouldn't right if we're going to be christians if we're going to call ourselves christians we ought to listen to what the bible and the spirit of prophecy has to say about any subject because that's the holy spirit when he's right when he's uh, working through ellen white's pen that's the holy spirit is revealing information, in this case, about himself. And if, if he reveals himself in a certain way to us, then it's our duty to accept whatever he says because it is God who reveals himself to us and not us who define who God is. That's not how it works. So if he says something plainly, our part is to believe and accept. Another warning from Mrs. White, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of scriptures and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. That's from Acts of the Apostles, page 52. But that's not what people do, right? This is one of the major issues in the church right now. One of the major issues. So that's why we're studying the history. So let's look at, let's look at uh, Dudley Canwright. He's a pretty solid source, right? He's a trustworthy source, right? The man who became the, the, most, the most prominent enemy of Seventh-day Adventism, right up to and including today. Because the, the books by Walter Ray on plagiarism and, and these, a lot of these other authors that have made arguments against Ellen White being a true prophet, they, you know where they come from? They come from two books by Dudley Camright, Seventh-day Adventism Renounce and The Life of Mrs. White. So no, he, he rejected the truth. He's not a trustworthy, but you, when you talk to people about the Holy Spirit, they will quote this guy all the time and say, look, this is what the pioneers believe. Well, which pioneers exactly am I supposed to believe? 
I'll tell you what we're supposed to believe. We're supposed to believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. You want to read the pioneers? Go for it. They, they say some wonderful things. AT, some of A.T. Jones' books and, and uh, E.J. Wagner's books are, are second to none. They're just amazing research that goes into them. But you take all that with a grain of salt. You read it, you read it in the sense of saying, well, if it lines up with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then I'll accept it. If it doesn't, then sorry. But this is from Dudley Canwright, Signs of the Times, July 25th, 1878, article on the Holy Spirit. This is what he said. All Trinitarian creeds make the Holy Ghost a person, equal in substance, power, and eternity, and glory with the Father and the Son. Thus they claim three persons in the Trinity, each one equal to both the others. If this be so, then the Holy Spirit is just as truly an individual, intelligent person, as is the Father or the Son. But this we cannot believe. The Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit is not a person, but is an influence proceeding from God. That's what he says. So all the scriptures clearly point that it's, it's personifying the Holy Spirit, but he says, but this we cannot believe. And honestly, a lot of times, one thing I'm just going to tell you right now, when you read, when you read the, uh, the pioneers, especially in regards to the Holy Spirit, don't be bamboozled by some of these quotes. Actually, listen to, what, listen to, listen to argumentation of that particular pioneer. Because many times, you'll see a, a pioneer saying, like, the, the, the belief in the Holy Spirit is ridiculous. They'll say something like that. And then they'll start to talk about the Council of Nicaea, and they'll talk about how Constantine said that the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit were all one in the same, as in the actual same person that can be subdivided into three parts. And many times, that's their criticism. And that's a solid criticism, because that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. You see, the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son, they are one in purpose. They are one in unity. They're not one being which is what the creeds say. So keep that in mind next time somebody tries to throw uh, the gauntlet down on the Holy Spirit issue with you. Here's another example. This is from Uriah Smith, Review and Herald, October 28, 1890. The question chair. He says, uh, the terms Holy Ghost are a harsh and repulsive translation. It should be ho Holy Spirit, Hagion uh, Nema. In every instance, the Spirit is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit being the same, whether it is spoken of as pertaining to God or Christ. But respecting the Spirit, the Bible uses expressions which cannot ha be harmonized with the idea that it is a person like the Father and the Son. Rather, it is shown to be a divine influence from them both. The medium represents their presence and by which they have knowledge and power through all the universe when not personally present. This is the man that also said, by the way, and I know that people are going to get upset about this, this is the man who also said that the king of the north is Turkey, and so many people accept and believe that today. This is the man who also re rejected the message of righteousness by faith in the late 1800s given by E.J. Uh, e. Wagner and A.T. Jones. Okay? So these, not, these people aren't perfect. Again, which pioneers? So I'm going to show you some other pioneers here shortly. Here's another example. M.C. Wilcox, Questions and Answers, Pacific Press. This is 1911, page 188. He says, The Holy Spirit is the mighty energy of the Godhead, the life and power of God flowing out from him to all parts of the universe, and thus making a living connection between his throne and all creation. Saying that he's in He's a presence. However, we see a different, we see a change here. Starting in the late 1800s from those who are strictly anti-Trinitarian. Remember, they, a lot, for a while, the early Adventists believed that uh, Jesus Christ was a created being and that he wasn't eternal for quite a long time. So there, a change started to take place. And this started in the, in the late 1800s. And I have no doubt about this, that the reason why this, this issue 
had to be dealt with by Ellen White is because it was such a, a that people wouldn't drop it and leave it alone. She told, she told them silence is golden, but nobody would listen. They would just keep running their mouths back and forth. And so she ended up settling the issue. But this is from J.H. Wagner, the father of E.J. Wagner. This is uh, on Life Sketches of James and Ellen White. That was written by them. But this is in the annex, and it's, in, it's not in some of the later versions, but it's in one of the newer versions. You could still find it. The 1888 edition, this is page 408 and 409. He says, we have no sympathy with the speculations in which many indulge in regarding to the nature or order of the Holy Spirit, whether a person or an animation from the Father and Son, as some teach, or a manifestation of the power of God, as other argues. others argue. We have no opinion to offer. He's speaking for Adventism at that time. In the annex of this book, the life sketches of James and Ellen White. And what's he saying? He's saying, no, 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 we're not anti-Trinitarians. And we're also not Trinitarians. We have no opinion. So again, which pioneers do you want to listen to? He's speaking on behalf of the church in a book that was written by James and Ellen White. The White Estate confirms that this is a solid source. This is from... This is from a website called c7da.us uh, articles, and they, they contacted the White Estate about this passage, which no longer appears in the newer printings, but it, it appeared in the original one. It says, an email has been received from the White Estate on the quotation confirming its authenticity, yet lending surprising details about its author. It appears this section was published anonymously by the SDA Publishing Association after the death of James White being primarily written by J.H. Wagner. It was an addition of the denominational publishing house, not the words of the original author. Uh, may be significant and is certainly surprising. The implication is that we encapsulated the, in the statement represented not only James and Ellen White, but accurately reflected the denominational position in 1888. The White Estate responds. They say, thank you for your email. The pages you sent are from the appendix to the 1888 edition of the life and sketches of James and Ellen White, not to be confused with Ellen White's life sketches written in 1915. Approximately, the first half of the book was taken from James White's autobiography, and the second half was drawn from Ellen White's autobiography, Mostly Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2. The six appendix chapters, of which one in question is the fifth, were prepared by the publisher... Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Association after James White's death in 1881. The principal author was J.H. Wagner, although the appendix is published anonymously. We trust this information is helpful to you. God bless. Tim uh, Poirier, Vice Director of, Ellen, uh, of the E.G. White Estate. So it's a legitimate statement, and it's speaking on behalf of the entire denomination. M. L. Andreessen powerful Seventh-day Adventist in the 20th century. In his uh, publication, The Spirit of Prophecy, a chapel talk, sorry, chapel talk in Loma Linda, California, November 30th, 1948, he said this, how astonished we were when The Desire of Ages was first published. It was first published in 1898, folks. So late 1800s, this is when Ellen White and the Holy Spirit really are starting to say, okay, enough is enough. We're dealing with this now. So he says, how astonished we were when The Desire of Ages was first published in 1898, for it contained some things that we considered unbelievable. Amongst others, the doctrine of the Trinity, which was not generally accepted by Adventists then. What did he just say? What did he just say? The understanding that the Holy Spirit is a person, that was in the Desire of Ages, written by her own hand, by the way, according to, to uh, his research that he found. He found some of the handwritten copies. The Trinity was reflected there in the Desire of Ages. Now, what's that quote? Let's go to Desire of Ages, page 671. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to the satanic cap captivity was amazing. 
Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. What did she just say? No modified energy. Not energy emanating from the Father and the Son. No. Full divine power. Third person. What does three mean? What does three mean? What's three mean? Three means that there's a one and a two, right? <laughs> Obviously. You know, people will say, yeah, he's the third person of the Godhead, but they never mention first person of the Godhead and second person. That's not an argument. When it says third, that means second and first are a given. They're given. See, you got to understand something. God is talking to human beings, right? Just as, just as we saw from these other passages and, and like as Paul's comments were saying, we can never truly understand what all this means. But what we can do is we can accept the statements that have been given to us on these issues. And if we think about this, remember, we're human beings. If three means two, if three means one, well, then that's great. But we don't know that. And we have to understand something here. God is speaking to man, and God is trying to speak to him in a way that he can understand. God is the creator of math. And God knows that in my mind, when I read three, that three means three and not two or one. I can't believe I have to explain that. Um, the Holy Spirit sheds more light on this as well. Manuscript 66 from 1899 from a talk to the students at the Avondale School. Mrs. White says, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who as, is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. He's a person, and he's walking through the grounds at Avondale School. Another one from Manuscript 20, 1906. The Holy Spirit is a person. You know, a lot of times you, you'll talk to some of these folks, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, he's a person, but, uh, you know, person doesn't mean person. It's, ama it's, it's Honestly, it's amazing. These people, if, if their theological uh, abilities were, were as good as, as, their, as their desire to evangelize the world with the third angel's message, we wouldn't be here anymore. Amen. But yes, the Holy Spirit is a person. Think about who God's talking to. He's talking to us. What does a person mean to me? What does it mean to you? It means a person, right? Separate entity, right? It's not the Father. It's not the Son. It's something else. It has its own personality. It is a person, just like Paul is not me. Paul is not me. Paul is his own person. Pastor Bill is his own person. But somebody, you could, you could turn around. You could hear somebody say, you might even hear one, uh, any of us say, uh, Paul, uh, Pastor Hughes, and Cody Mori are one in this. Yeah, one in purpose and unity and desire to spread the truth. Doesn't mean we're the same person, right? It's just like when a, when a husband and wife get together. They are one. The two become one flesh. That doesn't mean they lose, lose their personhood. It means that spiritually speaking, they are to be unified in all things. That's why people say we, we still have this in our lingo today. A wife could say, to somebody who has a disagreement with someone about her husband, she could say something as simple as, my husband and, and, and I are one on this issue. Everyone knows what they're talking about. It doesn't mean, the, the person doesn't sit there and scratch their head and go, oh, I thought you guys were actually separate people. I didn't know you were the same person. You know, it's ridiculous. Paul? Or what about the statement, my better half? Right, yeah, my Does better half. Does that mean yeah. you're splitting yourself in half? Exactly. Well, what I was gonna say, listening to this, Oh, well, three doesn't mean three, one doesn't mean one, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but do you know what kind of argument that is? Where That's evolution. It's Orwellian. In, <laughs> yeah, in evolution, these are the very arguments. When there's a plain, thus saith the fact, fact, mm -hmm. oh, no, that's not what it means. Yeah. That's the exact same mindset, which is from where? It's there to disprove 
God and undermine his law. So these people that make these insane arguments, it's the same mindset as somebody putting forth the theory of evolution. Yeah, it's expert, le it's, it's Olympic level uh, theological misinterpretations and it comes straight from the devil because it's actually politics and not theology in the end. Mrs. White says this, the Holy Spirit is a person for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with its own evidence. At such times, we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a personality. Uh-oh, now we're getting more information. A personality. So not only is he a person, so if you try to say, oh, yeah, but person doesn't mean person, but he has his own personality. So now what do you do with that? It goes on, it says, else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person. What does that mean? He's God. That's what it means. What's a divine person? That's God. Jesus is a divine person. The Father is a divine person. The Holy Spirit, according to Mrs. White, is a divine person. Am I a divine person? That would be blasphemy for me to say that. Something other than God saying that is blasphemy. But that's, see, that's, we can't accept these plain statements. I don't understand why. He must also be a divine person, she says, else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. You see, he knows, the, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God and he can read our hearts. It goes on, it says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Again, Manuscript 20, 1906. And so we have an individual, a pioneer. Yet yeah, Remember the, 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 the argument, the pioneers? Well, I got some pioneers for you. You ready for some pioneers? I'm excited. I'm ready to listen to the pioneers. You guys ready to listen to the I am. Go ahead, Rita. <laughs> I have, even, yeah. I have even read where Mrs. White says that you should not call the Holy Spirit it. He's a him. Amen. 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 But yeah, and people say that all the time. Well, they says he's an it in some places. And it's, it's, it's like, but even in our own vernacular, if you knock on the door and someone says, who is it? Right? Who is it? And then you say, it's me. Right? That's how we talk sometimes. But yeah, we shouldn't be calling him an it because he's a him. And people will look at these quotes and they go, oh, you got these quotes from Evangelism, which was a book that was written by Leroy Froome. And, Leroy, and it wasn't written by him, guys. It wasn't written by him. It was, it was written by the Spirit of Prophecy, Manuscript 20 and Manuscript 66 here. They'll say, oh, you can't trust Froome. Why? What's wrong with the book Evangelism? Do you think, do you really, do you understand how, how uh, someone undertakes the work of putting together a compilation of Mrs. White's writings? Do you think Leroy Froome sat down there? Do you really think that? And he actually looked and found all these different quotes and then twisted them out of context, which these are not out of context, because you can go read them for yourself. And he left, he left the citations in there. That's not how it works. Froome was overseeing a group of people that were looking into these things, and they were putting together the compilation themselves. We don't, I don't necessarily know who those people are. Maybe their names are listed somewhere. But it wasn't Leroy Froome that put the compilation together. He just oversaw the project. That's like saying you can't read the King James Bible because King James was a persecuting king who believed in the divine right of kings and persecuted the pilgrims and called them separatists and forced them to leave where they eventually came to the United States to avoid political, political and religious persecution. No, King James didn't sit down there and get the quotes together. I'm sure he helped out a couple times maybe because that's what people in charge like to do. To put, oh, what about this quote? This seems like it's good. Maybe. But primarily, no, he wasn't involved. Same thing with Froome. <clears throat> so here we go. Here we go with some pioneers. I got some pioneers for you guys. This is R.A. Underwood. The Holy Spirit is a person is the name of the article. Review and Herald, 
uh, volume 75, number 20, March, or sorry, May 17th, 1898. So around the same time, Mrs. White comes out with that very powerful statement in Desire of Ages about the Holy Spirit being a person is when this article is written. He says, and listen to the logic. The logic is airtight, folks. <clears throat> it seems strange to me now that I ever believed that the Holy Spirit was only an influence. So he's converted. He's changed his belief. He thought the Holy Spirit was an eminent, just a, a spirit that emanated from the Father and Son, just like so many do. But he says, it seems strange to me now that I ever believed that the Holy Spirit was only an influence in view of the work he does. But we want the truth because it's the truth, and we reject error because it is error. Regardless of any views we may have formally held or any difficulty we may have had or may now have, when we view the Holy Spirit as a person. Light is shown for the righteous. Satan's scheme is to destroy all faith in the personality of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Also, in his own personality. And when this is done, he would have men deify the state and set that up as a personal God to be worshipped and obeyed. Ah, that's absolutely true. The more we move away from God, the more we, we move towards... Uh, deifying the state and the government. He goes on, he says, Let us beware lest Satan shall lead us to take the first step in destroying our faith in the personality of the person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost. Wow. He goes on, he says, It was once hard for me to see how a spirit could be a person. But when I saw that God is a spirit, John chapter 4, verse 24, and that he is no less a person, and when I saw that the last Adam, Christ, was made a quickening spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, and that he is a person. And when I saw that the angels are spirits, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7 and 14, and even the fallen angels called devils are said to be unclean spirits from Luke chapter 8, 26, 29, Acts chapter 19, 15, and 16. And knowing that all these are persons... I could understand better how the Holy Spirit could be a person Christ has put into the field as his personal representative, the Holy Ghost, who is in charge of all the forces of God's kingdom to overthrow Satan and his angels. And the Holy Ghost is the only one to whom is delegated this authority from God. The prince of the power of evil can be held in check only by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. He's quoting Desire of Ages. He's quoting Desire of Ages the same year that it was published for all the folks that try to say that it was changed later. Same year, 1898. A few more quotes here, and, uh, and we'll close. The spirit of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, repeated again in Special Testimonies, Series A, number 10, page 37, written in 1897. So this quote was out, this quote, which is almost verbatim, the same quote she includes in The Desire of Ages, is included here again a year prior. Another quote from Special Testimony, Series B, number 7, page 62 and 63, written in 1905, it says, The Comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Three persons in the heavenly trio, what does that mean? To me, it means there's three persons in the heavenly trio. What does it mean to you? Oh, well, I have a 45-minute answer about this. Okay, well, why don't you just um, keep that 45-minute answer, and I will accept the, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as it reads. You know, when you're baptized, Jesus says in the commission in, in Matthew chapter 28, 
He says that when you're baptized, when he tells his disciples to go out into the world, teaching them to obey all things that he's told them, and baptize people in the name of who? The Father. Right? He didn't say Jehovah or Yahweh, by the way. He said in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and then he used a very special word there that I think that we forget. He used the word and. He used the word and. Do you guys know what and means? Do you know what and means? And means in addition to what was just mentioned. So father, son, and, so in addition to that, the Holy Ghost, right? Another comforter. What, the, what does the word another mean? It means the same person? No. It means another. Just like the word and, if I say, I have three cars, right? I'm, maybe I won't even say that. I'll just say, I have, I have a Jeep, I have a motorcycle, and I have, I don't know, a Mustang. Does that mean that one of the cars actually is the other two vehicles? Is that what that means? No, it doesn't mean that. Everybody knows this. You've got to remember, who's God talking to? He's talking to his people. And when he's talking to his people, he's speaking in a way that they can understand. Mrs. White says, when we read the scriptures, we're supposed to take we're supposed to take it as it reads in the most plainest sense. We're not supposed to allegorize it or try to twist it and make it th say things that it's not saying. And folks, the reason why we're doing this sermon in this little series here is because these people are the most, the most militant of any of the false doctrines that are out there. And it's for a few reasons. It's because, one, clearly they're disconnected from God. Two, They've given up, given the three angels' messages. And I'm, talk, I'm not talking about people who are confused. People who are confused about this, that's one thing. Okay? The people who are militant about this, they're lost. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not pulling punches anymore. They're lost. That's a hard card to throw down. But we're throwing it down. If you have given up giving the third angel's message, it doesn't matter what doctrine it is. If you've given up giving the third angel's message and now this is your third angel's message and I've heard people say that, you're lost. That's it. You're lost. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you don't give the third angel's message, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, period. Full stop. So when Diop and some of these other leaders are saying, oh, you know, the, the third angel's message, you know, that, that's hate speech. And we shouldn't be talking about that. And we're going to be giving that up. Okay, well, then you're no longer a Seventh-day Adventist. And the people who are, who are on this Holy Spirit kick, you know where they are spiritually? They're on a vehicle. They're on a train, actually. They're on the bullet train that Mrs. White said in her visions, who the conductor of is Lucifer himself. And where, where is the destination of that train? Hell. The lake of fire. That's where this ends. Because I've seen people twist this. I've, seen, I've, I've, laid out the, the, I've laid out the passages where Mrs. White says, silence is golden, don't talk about it. And they say, yeah, well, you know, that's not what, exactly what that means. And you say, well, the Holy Spirit's a person. Some of them will say, no, the Holy Spirit's not a person. Others will say, yes, the Holy Spirit is a person, but it's actually Jesus Christ. Or they'll say, well, person doesn't actually mean person. Uh, I mean, th there's, there's a lot that goes into it. That's why we're going to be talking about this. But one more here from Manuscript 92, 1901. When you gave yourself to Christ, you made a pledge in the presence of the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit emanated from the Father and the Son, you wouldn't need to do it in His presence because He's already there in the person of the Son and the Father, right? So that's not what it says. It says, you made a pledge in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three great 
personal dignitaries, dignitaries sorry, of heaven hold fast to this pledge. The Holy Spirit, His job is to prepare our prayers. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And Mrs. White has commentary on this that Rita brought to my attention years ago. It's from Manuscript 50, 1900. It says this, Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. The Spirit pleads not for us, as does Christ, who presents his blood, shed from the foundation of the world. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise and thanksgiving. The gratitude which flows from our lips is the result of the Spirit striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening the music of the heart. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit does not work the same way that Jesus does. Right? They, they, they think differently and they try to convert us to the truth differently. Just like when Paul, Paul me and Paul can have the exact and Bill, too. Let's throw him in there. We can have the exact same topic. Give us the same topic. We could approach it from three different ways and get to the same destination. Because they're different persons. And I'll, I'll give you one more tidbit before we, before we close. Inside the heavenly sanctuary, there are pieces of furniture in there that we know also represent people, right? On the mercy seat, you have the Shekinah glory that sits on that throne. Who's that represent? Who dwells in light unapproachable? The Father. The Father dwells in light unapproachable. His glory cannot be seen by the eyes of man, or otherwise we would perish. Even unfallen beings would perish. He dwells in light unapproachable. You also have the table of showbread. On the table of showbread, there's bread. Who's the bread from heaven? Who's our daily bread? What does bread represent? Food. But also, the word of God is bread. Who's the word of God? Jesus, who also called himself the bread of heaven. In John chapter 8. So there's two people there. We just read what the Holy Spirit's job is, right? The Holy Spirit's job is what? To prepare prayers. Is there any piece of furniture in the sanctuary that is strictly dedicated and representative of prayers? There is. It's called the altar of incense. And on the incense, it's mingled with the frankincense which represents the merits of Christ, and the, the smoke that comes up represents the prayers of God's people to Him. Did you know that all those pieces of furniture that I just, represent, that I just uh, told you about, that clearly are in direct connection with a person of the Godhead, would it fascinate you to know that each one of those pieces of furniture and nothing else in the sanctuary has a crown around it? There's a crown there. There's a crown on three and only three pieces of furniture in the sanctuary. The table of showbread, representing Jesus Christ. The altar of incense, representing the Holy Spirit. And the mercy seat, representing the Father in the Shekinah glory. Isn't that amazing? And I've even told people that, and they've rejected even that. They said, well, it's not exactly crowns. Even though it says it's crowns, it does. Read it for yourself. Exodus chapter 25 and on. Read it for yourself. The fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit is a person. And that wasn't as big of a deal in early Adventism. But as these people became more and more militant, because you've got to remember there was every manner of individual, type of individual that was part of the Millerite movement, 
Many of them branched off and became parts of different groups. One of them was eventually became the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then he also had the First Day Adventists as well. But as the people who loved the Lord studied these things out, just like we read from Proverbs chapter 4, more and more light shone upon their path until they got to the point where they understood that, yes, well, Catholicism is wrong about the Trinity. They are. They are wrong. Two things can be true at the same time, right? The truth is, the Catholics are wrong about the Trinity. God is not a single entity that is represented in three persons. He's not. The truth is, is that God is three persons who are one in spirit, in purpose, in truth. And that's, that's what the denominational stance grew to over time, including Stephen Haskell, which he uses the word Trinity, folks, in his book, The Seer of Patmos. He uses that word. And we'll take a look at that as we uh, continue this study next time. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the record that you have kept of the truth. That the truth lights up the darkness, Lord, and that it cannot hide. That these people that have been going around browbeating and trying to bamboozle people into a false doctrine, that once we look into the history, if you're willing to do the research, as Chris Chung did, that you can find the truth, and it's right there. It's right there and so clear. We thank you for that, Lord. We ask that you would help us as we continue this study to see this more clearly and to actually see how satanic it really is to be a part of these militant groups focused on false doctrines. We pray that you would open their eyes to it as well so that they could come back into the truth and not be lost, but do the work that you've given them to do and us, which is the proclamation of the third angel's message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.